Okay, uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Marcos and Kevin and Daniel, the other organizers, for inviting me. I'm always very happy to come back here. Um, I'm going to um, talk about the uh, general theme of how to compute thermalization dynamics and transport in strongly coupled systems. I'll start with a shorter part uh, of something that you might have already heard from me about, or some, some of you. Uh, time-dependent variation in principle with matrix product states for calculating uh, thermalization. And then uh, I'll talk about uh, new work uh, in uh, uh, using a uh, very different approach. Uh, so to motivate, um, actually I don't need much motivation because uh, today's two talks, uh, both um, uh, with Seam and uh, Mar uh, Martin, uh, motivated it very well. We want to understand transport and dynamics and unconventional systems where Boltzmann theory doesn't work and uh, there is no small parameter that um, uh, justifies a weak coupling expansion or perturbative expansion to compute the Kubo formula, for example. So one, one example is uh, the uh, uh, transport in strange methods, but also relaxation dynamics seen in quenches in ultra-cold atoms, uh, like for example, these slow relaxation seen near the many body localization phase transition, and, and other system uh, cases where, where there is no uh, quasi particle, where there are no quasi particles or small parameters that would justify Boltzmann theory. Uh, so, again, I just am showing, and I don't really need to show this slide here after we seen a really nice talk about this, but again, this is uh, for those of you who are not here. Uh, this is a pretty beautiful measurement in optical analysis of the diffusion constant in a system that's really strongly interacting, where the only method to try to calculate things uh, is exact analyzation, but this is limited for very small times and, and small system sizes. Um, and uh, these are the results that, that we seem showed today, and um, it, there is, of course, the very uh, appealing uh, or suggestive uh, comparison to the cuprates, where there is also a, an, an, a class of other strongly correlated systems where you see uh, linear and temperature uh, behavior of the resistivity. Uh, okay, so, so how do we characterize uh, thermalization dynamics? There has been um, a lot of interest in that um, recently, both in, in cold atom, condensed matter, and uh, high energy physics community. Uh, starting from ideas about quantum chaos and black holes. Uh, and, and one of the interesting things is that people started to uh, try to diagnose uh, the onset of thermalization or onset of chaos using uh, uh, out of time, so called out of time order correlation functions. And uh, that one expects in certain cases will. Um, will behave exponentially, will grow exponentially. This is um, a commutator between two operators that grows exponentially. And a nice example um, of that is if you start from, a, in, if you're in a, Majorana, a model of Majorana fermions with some weak interactions, then you start, if you start with a single Majorana fermion, uh, then upon applying the uh, Luvillian on it, upon time evolution, uh, it splits into uh, from one Majorana into three Majoranas, and from three Majoranas it can branch into split into more and more, and becomes a more and more complicated operator with time. And of course, this is just one possible branch, and there are many, many branches that can uh, that appear, appear in superposition. And what this uh, commutator does, if you think about it, if you think of the B operator here, as some extensive operator made of a sum, uh, then it simply diagnoses on how many points we don't commute. So it really measures the size of this operator. So as this operator becomes larger and larger, this uh, out of time order correlation grows, and it grows exponentially if there is kind of an exponential tree structure uh, for a sufficiently long time. Uh, so this is, this is an exact, and one believes that as this operator grows, uh, it becomes more and more complicated. Uh, information flows from local degrees of freedom to highly non-local ones, and that gives that allows for irreversibility because information is effectively lost into extremely non-local degrees of freedom. And 
it allows at the next stage for hydrodynamics to develop. And we heard a lot about hydrodynamics. Um, and, and this hydrodynamics is governed by a very small set of coefficients. If we're able to calculate them, we'll know uh, the dynamics of the system at uh, long distances. So uh, when we have conserved quantities, then the hydrodynamics is basically the diffusion of these conserved quantities. This is the simplest case oops, where there is only energy diffusion, for example. Um, so uh, the question is, uh, can we uh, calculate this kind of thermalization dynamics in a thermalizing system? And usually uh, the answer is that it's, it's very, very hard. Uh, we don't have Monte Carlo for dynamics. Um, exact diagonalization is for very small systems. We have DMRG, time-dependent DMRG, but the usual problem that uh, people cite is that um, as you uh, go to longer and longer times, uh, the entanglement entropy grows linearly, which means that the number of states you have to keep in this DMRG grows exponentially in time, and you hit an exponential wall. So, so again, there is an obstruction of calculating dynamics. But here there is an apparent paradox, because as I just mentioned, uh, we expect that after a fairly short time of order one of the thermalization time, there is an emergent classical dynamics that basically follows this uh, chaotic regime, gives you local thermalization, and this local thermalization starts out uh, 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 effective classical dynamics. So why do we need so much entanglement to cap in order to capture effectively classical dynamics? And, and this is the paradox that I, I want to address in this talk. I, I'm not saying that I have a full solution to it, but and show two approaches that in various regimes seem to um, capture this correctly. So here is another view of this paradox as kind of an information paradox that I like to, another way I like to view it. Uh, if, if I look at the number of bits of information I need in order to capture the dynamics as a function of time, then if I do a microscopic calculation like DMRG, then uh, the number of bits, and I start from a product state, but as, as the system evolves, I need higher and higher bond dimension to capture more and more entanglement, then the number of bits I need grow exponentially with time. On the other hand, if I think of the system close to equilibrium, at equi thermal equilibrium, all I need is the information about the few Lagrange multipliers that set the conserved quantities of my um, the conserved quantities, and, and that's all I need to describe the equilibrium state. And as I go backward in time, there are hydrodynamic modes that decay, and as I go more and more backward in time, there are more of them present, and I need to know about them, but, but it doesn't diverge at this finite time scale. So there is, um, there, is, there is some hump here. If I'm able to overcome this hump and go into the hydrodynamic regime, perhaps I don't need so much information in order to capture the long time dynamics. And again, the, the postulate is that you only need the entanglement up to ranges of approximately a thermalization rate, uh, a thermalization length, length scale, uh, related to a thermalization time scale, and not more than that in order to capture the hydrodynamics. The question, of course, which is, which doesn't have a definite answer, is how to truncate the entanglement in a way that will not sacrifice information on these uh, conserved quantities and uh, hydrodynamic modes you want to capture. Okay. Um, here is an illustration, um, well, I'll, I'll not go over that because it would take me some time to describe this graph. It's just a, a way to illustrate that there are measures that show this hump, that this information paradox is actually real. Um, uh, so in, the, in this talk, I want to discuss two approaches. One I'll, I'll do pretty fast because I already talked about it a number of times. Um, it's a time-dependent variation and principle with matrix product states. Um, and the second approach, which is not limited to uh, one dimension and not using even tensor networks, is uh, using uh, methods of operator dynamics in a truncated space. Um, so I'll start with the uh, uh, matrix product states. So a matrix product state is, uh, can be thought of as a variation at ansatz. This has been already, you know, uh, time-dependent variation uh, principle with matrix product states has been introduced by several authors, uh, 
especially Jules Hedman and collaborators, uh, and they have shown a very efficient algorithm to propagate this kind of state in time. Uh, what we say is that this is a very, um, uh, a very natural state to use uh, in order to get uh, thermalization dynamics. And uh, if you use usual time-dependent DMRG, you say, um, uh, in, in either case, you will, of course, not be able to calculate the uh, entanglement entropy. You will not see the entanglement entropy growth beyond a maximum of log of the bond dimension. The problem with usual time-dependent DMRG is, is that um, when you go above, uh, when you go to times where the entropy would be larger than the maximum you can capture, your error uh, would start to increase. And when the error increases, um, then uh, all head, head breaks loose. You don't uh, conserve energy. You don't conserve other conserved quantities. The nice thing about um, the variation and principle is that it, it really is def defining dynamics on some classical uh, manifold um, that is governed by a classical Hamiltonian that exactly gives the classical energy, the energy. So, so you have, by definition, classic, uh, uh, energy conserving dynamics. So energy is perfectly conserved. Um, this variation in principle gives you classical Hamiltonian equations of motion that are, in general, very, very complex in a high dimensional space, which is the dimension of, uh, dimension of all the, uh, the space made of all the variational parameters in this matrix product state. And usually, this kind of complex dynamics is chaotic, and it leads to thermalization and um, hydrodynamics in the classical sense. So in this kind of calculation, you're guaranteed to get thermalization and hydrodynamics. What you're not guaranteed is that at the hydrodynamics is governed by the correct diffusion constant. And the hope is, which we cannot prove that it will always happen, is that these diffusion constants that interest you will converge as we increase the bond dimension. What we know is when we increase the bond dimension chi, which is the size of the matrices, to an exponentially large size in the system size, uh, then, then this calculation becomes exact. And of course, we will get the correct coefficients. But of course, we hope that it will converge much, much faster than that. And of course, for that, there is no guarantee. Um, OK, so here is an example of such a calculation. We calculate um, it for this. Um, model system, which is just the uh, uh, transverse and longitudinal field Eisen model. It's a non-integrable uh, system. We start by st we start the system in a in a product state, some random product state, and then apply to it um, operator S plus in the middle. Okay, so that sets one spin up, and all the rest are in a random uh, random product state. We average over these ensembles of random product states, and then uh, plot the energy as a function of the local energy as a function of, of um, sorry, this is not time. This is <coughs> local, sorry, this is uh, i as a function of space. And you see that after some 60 uh, time steps, it looks fairly nicely like a, um, a Gaussian. And the Gaussian expands diffusively as you see here, basically, the, this is the variance. The variance grows li is linearly, which means that it sets a diffusion constant equal to 0.19. And, and as we increase the bond dimension from 4 to 8, and also to higher bond dimensions, it doesn't change. It gives the correct slope, which you can also see, at least in this specific model, you can see it pretty well in um, exact diagonalization. So at least for this model, it looks like the, um, uh, the convergence is very nice to the correct diffusion constant. This is not always the case. Here is another model, which is an XXZ model with uh, some uh, exponentially decaying interaction. And in this case, uh, this is exact diagonalization. This is the time-dependent variation of the principle. And you see that as we increase bond dimension, uh, at the time at which it reaches the maximal entropy, the calculation fails, and, and the diffusion reverts to an unphysical, much smaller diffusion constant. Okay? Fortunately, you can see it from, um, from the calculation. You see that it doesn't converge. You go to larger and larger bond dimension, and you see that it, um, it does not converge. Um, so we, we have to say, I don't understand this very well. I don't understand when it will converge and when it will not. Uh, but at least we have cer certain cases of 
non-integrable models where it converges very well. And in these models, we can also try to study other things and check their convergence, like the a diagnostic of chaos. So, so here we diagnose chaos by applying some perturbation to the system at the edge. In this case, the perturbation needs to be unitary, so it will have only a local effect. Uh, uh, we take two copies of the same state. Psi 2 and Psi 1 are two copies of exactly the same state. We apply the perturbation to one and not to the other, and then um, uh, time evolve it, and look at the deviation of the reduced density matrix of um, the part of the system, which is um, from, uh, from some partition distance x away from the perturbation uh, and to all the way to the minus infinity or to the rest of the system. So, so this is a partial uh, reduced density matrix. And these two partial reduced density matrices start to deviate away from each other. And we plot this deviation. Okay? And it's normalized so that the deviation will go from 0 to 1. Uh, and you see that there is this deviation, uh, which is sort of like chaotic deviation between two nearby trajectories. Um, it, it has some, in X and T, it has some kind of butterfly effect. Uh, it affects further um, uh, points uh, at, at a long, longer time. And, and we can look at cuts of, of this propagation of the front. And it looks more or less like it's uh, propagating at a constant velocity. Uh, but if we try to shift the curves to each other by subtracting some v times t, some constant velocity times t, we can't get them to collapse until, unless we also um, scale, rescale the x-axis by square root of t, which means that it's not only uh, the, the front is not only advancing at a constant velocity, it's also growing at, uh, with a diffusive um, dependence like of square root of t. Uh, and this is nice because uh, this is also what these uh, toy models made of random time-dependent unitaries are showing, exactly this kind of bias diffusion uh, dynamics. Only these toy models are, are toy models in the sense that they are not describing um, Hamiltonian evolution, while this is describing reversible Hamiltonian evolution um, with energy conservation. And, oh, yeah, all of this is infinite temperature. But in principle, we can do the same at finite temperature. And the way to do it is to take the ensemble of initial states and propagate it in imaginary time first. But this is infinite temperature. But infinite temperature with conserved energy. Um, OK, so um, this is what I want to say about the variational dynamics. Uh, now I want to turn to a, a new method. The reason why we need a new method is the variation of dynamics is very nice, but it, as you saw, see, it doesn't always work. That's one uh, problem. The other problem, it's very limited to one dimension. And we want to uh, use something in which we can calculate, for example, dynamics and the Hubbard model, for example, uh, to try to understand what seems results. Um, so I'm going to take a different approach. Uh, and uh, This is done with uh, Jan Liu Kao and Daniel Parker. Berkeley and uh, David uh, Hughes and Arnold Mann uh, in, in Princeton. Um, and, and the idea is here to use uh, uh, operator dynamics. So operator is undergo Heisenberg evolution. And I'm going to always look at the, uh, at the uh, Hilbert space of operators. Operators make up a Hilbert space. I didn't write the scalar product, but the scalar product for me would be the trace between two operators. And in this, uh, in this Hilbert space, the, um, uh, the commutator is a superoperator, which I can call the, I call the Louvillian. So, so there is a Schrodinger equation of sorts, right, uh, that, uh, in which uh, uh, the Louvillian propagates our operators. Okay? And the goal is to compute the time evolution of operator approximately while capturing the long time dynamics of uh, local operators. Um, I, I want to point out that what we want to conserve here is energy and other conserved quantities. And energy conservation means that I need to preserve the trace of the Hamiltonian with my operator. Or in this notation, basically, the overlap of the Hamiltonian with uh, the operator has to be preserved under the time evolution. 
So any truncation I, I'm going to uh, do will will have to uh, preserve that. Otherwise, I won't capture the fusion. So you yes. Could ask for, um, um, like why is energy conserved? Like um, um, you're more thinking like a conversation within a closed system. Right? Yeah, yeah. But but then the hydrodynamics could only always uh, explain part of my system, like a subsystem to which the yeah. rest will put right. with the bar. Right. But if you cut it, then you don't actually have energy. Yeah, yeah, it's true. But but it, I, I I won't have energy conservation in a, in a part of the system, but only as a global conservation law. But I need energy continuity equation. Right, so when I say energy conservation, I mean that local energy, local energy density has a continuity equation. It can't escape to a bat um, at every point. Okay, but in the end, when you have a system for which which you want to behave hydrodynamically, and for that, you don't have energy conservation. No, yeah, for that I don't have energy conservation, but I'll have an energy continuity sense. equation for, for exactly. this, right? Yeah. So, so exactly. energy will yeah. energy that flows out will flow to the next subsystem. So that is essential for diffusion. Otherwise, we get just energy decaying exponentially and not diffusively. Local energy. Okay. Um, okay. So here is the way uh, I set up the problem. I'm going to use a basis for operators and. For now, I, I can do exactly the same for fermions, but for now, let's look at spin half systems. And, and the very convenient basis for spin halves are, are, is the basis of so called Pauli strings. This is direct products of Pauli matrices over my entire system. And each Pauli matrix can either be have a, an index zero, which means it's the unit matrix, or it can be either one, two, or three sigma x, sigma y, or sigma 3. And, and this basically parameter is a basis for all the operators in, in my Hilbert space. Um, I usually start with simple one-body initial operators. One-body initial operators means that one of these is non-zero, uh, non-unit, non sorry, non-unit matrix, and all the rest are unit <coughs> matrices. Uh, also, to simplify matters, we're going to do um, calculations in an infinite system, translationally invariant infinite system, which means that all my operators are actually sums of the local operators and not the local operator itself. But this can be changed, of course. This is not really something fundamental. Um, so now when I apply uh, the, the Louvillian, I propagate this uh, as, like, initial operator. And I can think of my Louvillian as some uh, Hopping matrix, uh, giving me hopping matrix elements between different points on this graph, where each point is is one Pauli string, represents one Pauli string. So there is a complicated graph starting from this point. This is I, I didn't do anything new. This is just you know how the problem is. The problem it's very complicated. There are many points in this graph, and the connectivity is complicated. So the question is what to do with that. Um, it's a, it's a single particle Hamiltonian hopping in this crazy graph. So now, the next step is we label vertices according to some physical measure of distance. Roughly speaking, you can think that a, a good measure of distance would be the size of the operator, how many non-zero Paulis there are in this string. Uh, and as you go to uh, apply the Louvillian more and more times, the operator will grow to more and more complicated uh, operators. We, we use a more sophisticated <coughs> measure of distance because it can capture integrable dynamics in some cases. But roughly speaking, what you have to keep in mind is that uh, the measure of distance is more or less the size of the operator. Really, we, we actually find the measure of distance, which is how many hops, we minimal number of hops we need to make in order to get from the initial operator to the operator at this side. Um, so what is happening here? We start from one-body operators, and according to this measure of distance, operators in general go to more and more complex ones. Very rarely does the op does an operator, especially when it's very large, it has many, many more ways of getting into more complex operators than coming back into simple ones. This is basically entropic. Okay. So so um, we have this flow of operators, and this is what allows for um, uh, diffusion. Actually, not all the operators flow to infin infinity. There is, for every operator, you will have some part of it that um, overlaps with the conserved quantity, like the Hamiltonian, and that part will have to stay in, in, uh, in the uh, region close to the origin, 
because it remains at two body state, and all the non-conserved parts flow away and give dissipation that allow this diffusion to occur. Uh, so what is the idea of our approximation scheme? We're going to partition the Hilbert space into small operators, uh, which are smaller than some distance from the origin, and large operators. And we're going to somehow try to integrate out what is happening uh, to, uh, uh, to long, large operators and get an effective description of small operators. Okay? And, and we are going to have a tuning parameter, which is what is the size of this truncation. And we're going to have two ways to, of doing this uh, integrating out. Uh, one which is uh, very kind of um, ad hoc, uh, but is very, very simple and works very nicely. It's, it, it, it is to take uh, and, and just you know, truncate the space, truncate the Louvillian uh, everywhere above a, a certain range from the origin. Uh, that's still not enough because this would still make the Louvillian uh, Hermitian and the time evolution unitary and there is going to be no decay. Uh, but the next thing is to ask, okay, what happens to an operator that reaches this boundary? An operator that reaches this boundary, the next hop will be out. So what, uh, what we add is we integrate out the um, out parts by, uh, taking, uh, by making a, an imaginary imaginary matrix elements here for operators hopping between the out parts and back into the... Uh, basically, when the operator reaches the uh, boundary, it is absorbed by the boundary and, and uh, escapes. It's like a photon that go, goes to the edge of the cavity and decides to go out of the mirror. Okay? So uh, here, the way we make it is we try to match the impedances so that the operators are very, very likely to be transmitted rather than uh, reflected back in, okay? Which means that we need this um, gamma, which is a dissipation parameter, to be not very small, because then it would be just a reflection. Not very large either, because, because, because then, because of Zeno effect, we get the total reflection. It has to be somewhere in the middle. The, the problem is that we have to set it somehow, and it's not given by this fundamental theory. So, so we're going to have a, to find a way to, to set this parameter. Um, good thing about this dynamics is it totally conserves energy, okay? Because energy is a small operator and we dissipate only operators that anyways have a zero trace with the energy. So this dynamics exactly conserves energy. So we should expect to get diffusion. Okay, I'm going to uh, postpone uh, saying how I uh, determine this parameter. I first want to show you results. How do results look? I can get results of different, in different ways, but uh, what I show you here are operators with different wave vectors, and, and this is the lowest eigenvalue for this, uh, um, of, of the Novillian for this value of k, and you see that it behaves you know, really, really nicely as a, a uh, as, as Q squared. So from this we can basically extract the diffusion constant. This is the decay of the operator as a function of Q. It goes like, um, the, the decay rate goes like Q squared, and this gives me the diffusion constant. In this case, it matches exactly what I got, got from time-dependent variation and principle and exact diagonalization uh, for the same model. And we can also, this is diagonalizing the Louvillian. Um, here I show more eigenvalues at k equals 0. At k equals 0, we get this zero mode always, which is just the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian doesn't decay. And, and the next mode above it is, turns out to be an extremely slow operator um, that happens to be there uh, for the Ising model. So it's, it's interesting to uh, try to understand what, what these low, slow operators that are non-diffusive, not, not exactly conserved mean, uh, and how, it, how does it, um, what does it have to do with uh, thermalization or possibly Lyapunov exponents? Um, but we can discuss this in some, uh, privately. Uh, we're, we, we determine the dissipation parameter gamma here. Here is gamma, gamma, when gamma is very small, we get zero, as I promised. When gamma is very large, it's also zero. Uh, it behaves kind of strangely in between, but there is a point where all of them meet. All, all of these lines are just lines of different truncations, different size ranges of truncation, and, and you see that there is a line where they meet very well, and that line is where the diffusion constant 
is exactly what I calculated from uh, time-dependent variation in principle. So it seems like there is at least an ad hoc way to determine the diffusion constant by the point diffusion becomes independent of uh, uh, in independent of size. Okay, so, so for the last five minutes, I want to discuss another approach uh, which does not involve putting by hand a dissipation parameter which we don't know in advance, okay? So can we, can we do it in a more fundamental way? Okay. Okay, okay. So, okay, so I'll, I'll go pretty fast. Uh, um, so I want to retain unitarity and reversibility of the dynamics and then also describe operator spreading. Oops. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> oh, PowerPoint crash. Probably had the timer in it. Limit. You have to do some numerical calculation to get it point, but it's not exponentially hard. 
and you can probably do it analytically if you go to the large Q limit of the uh, SYK model. Uh, and we have another model where we neglect interference effect in the motion of the operator, and then this linear coefficient comes just out of uh, combinatorial coefficients. Uh, so it suggests that any kind of interference effect when the uh, operator is sufficiently large are just renormalizing the slope of this uh, linear behavior, but not the fact that it's linear. Um, okay, so, um, so, so that suggests maybe uh, trying to switch exact numerical description of small operators and then uh, using the universal dynamics of uh, complex operators, knowing that they, are, um, uh, they behave linearly in this Lanchos space, uh, 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 yeah, basically allowing to integrate out their dynamics and, and get the exact numerical description of small operators. So, uh, okay, I'll, I'll stop here and let you answer, uh, let you ask questions. I'm interested about the dependence in time of this effective dissipation that you put in the second part of your talk. So I would expect that at the beginning it is essentially tiny or infinitesimal, and then it should ramp up very quickly when elastic processes become effective and drive you to thermalization. It's like that? Uh, uh, this effective dissipation that I put in is not something time dependent. I just I just determine it once. But shouldn't it become relevant at the moment in which non-integrability really makes you dissipate and go to the thermal state? And the beginning, when you just have still very strong oscillatory dynamics, should be completely ineffective. How, how does this take into account into, into the calculation? It, it, so first of all, at very short times, it doesn't matter what's there, because the operator has not, not reached that. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and a lot of you, and even okay. and even if some oper some part, some tail of the operator reached, some operators are still undergoing motion no. inside. So, uh, but but there is another point. It depends on the model. So so for example, you ask, in in our model, we actually capture exactly the transverse field Ising model for any time you want without ever writing a fermion. So it's all done in in uh, spin space. But, and, and you can ask, you know, why doesn't it feel that, you know, it reaches the boundary and I put some dissipation there? And the answer is because of the metric we put on the graph, it's not the size of the operator, but we, we have some metric of complexity. And in the Ising model, all, all the strings that we get are strings with two sigma z's and many sigma x's in the middle. So, so they're very non-complex. And if we make a, a measure of complex, a measure of complexity, then it captures the fact that they're non-complex and it keeps all this, these states as, as if they're close to the origin. I see. So, yeah. Do you understand it correctly that your gamma in the time confirm uh, is zero for, oh sorry, it's just chosen once and it doesn't matter? Yeah, well it matters what you choose, but you have to somehow so choose it. do it somehow it less at all, can I do a sort of like self-consistent procedure for it? So um, that it gets a flavor of, you know, effective medium approximation yeah, that, in that, operator. That state. would be very nice, as if, yeah, yeah, for example, by taking it, by increasing your, your cutoff size gradually, and then using the, um... No, but some call play. Yeah, we, we, we have... That there is a subset of operators, and you're saying, or oh, beyond this subset, it already feels like a matter of some kind of theoretic system. Yes, yeah, that's yeah. That's why so, I can absorb, so that's why maybe, can I... Yeah, that's what we are trying to do. That's exactly what we were trying to do by going to this Krillov space, to, because this Krillov sp space allows you to integrate out what's going on beyond some range and on, because it behaves like a non-interacting type binding model. And especially when it behaves with a constant linear slope, then you can integrate out what happens there exactly. So, that, uh, so, so that's what we're trying. Instead of effective medium approximation, our effective medium is this linearly growing um, Lanchos coefficient that we <coughs> calculate the self-energy at the last point uh, that we take into account. Right. So I don't know yet how to do it in the best way, but this is our goal, yes.
And what, what we do so far is we just do it for certain sizes and check where it crosses and becomes independent of size. So size. sizes is a, a different truncation ranges. So we truncate the range. Yeah, we choose, so you saw, we add graphs of what is the diffusion constant we get as a function of the damping coefficient for different truncation ranges. And you see that there is one point there where gamma is more or less one, uh, where uh, they all meet. And independent of size for sufficiently large uh, truncation size, operator size, uh, we get the same result. So that's how we, we determine this gamma. But again, the goal is to do what you are saying, somehow integrate out some kind of simple dynamics of the operators at long ranges so that we can put something there that is um, more fundamental. Say more about your study detail. Is it how local is it? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, it's very, very local. It's uh, one and two, ma mainly about I think 85 or 90 percent one and two side operator, and then there there is a. So I think it's closely related to this. Um, I think um, Lessig Mutrovich and, and his student they found some kind of slow operator in, in the Eisen model. I think it, it's this. But what I'm a bit surprised is they use some kind of shorter work transformation to find it. But if you do that, you get that it's, uh, it's lifetime is not, here are, it's lifetime is something like two over a thousand. It's, it's so, so small, sorry, the rate, the K, the K rate, inverse lifetime. But I, I don't understand why it's so small. It looks like it's smaller than it should be. So another question, so you have this boundary that you set for small operators or complex operators. So how do you enforce that they are always forward going? In other words, they don't go backwards, the operators. Because you say you don't want them to reflect, right? Oh, I, 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 the way is basically to put the uh, dissipation coefficient, the, one, the, the absorption on the wall, to be as good as possible for matching impedances with, with the, what's behind the wall. So, so that's put by hand then? Yeah, that's put by hand. However, what I said in the second part is kind of a first step towards integrating out the, the, the vacuum and, and getting it not by hand. Yeah. So anybody else? I'll take a picture of that. So the example you showed, we have a zero dimensional problem and we find involved in one dimensional problem. The two one-dimensional problems, one failed badly, and that was already one, apparently. It might have been the wrong way. Yeah. It was not so good. You know, I already had exponential interaction. So the question that I had is decay interaction. So the question in space, the question is, uh, you know, you have an idea if I go to higher dimension or even one dimension where the explanation is already very restricted. Have some longer range. No, no, no. I, I don't think it um, failed because it was exponentially decaying <coughs> fractions. It was just the reason why it was exponentially decaying is just to get a non integrable model. We actually have examples of completely local interactions that also fail. So, right. So, so the role of the range of interactions is not crucial. It's no. It's just no. neutral and Yeah. No, it's not even mutability. It's a non integrable Ah, yeah, yeah. So, we have different examples of non integrable models. Some fail and some don't. I think if we understand this better, maybe we can classify. Uh, we wish to understand it better. We don't so far. Uh, yeah.